was absent from. Dr. Stan Cook was there and a few other folks that were there as well. And I actually got a phone call one day driving down Highway 280 from Congressman Backus, believe it or not, actually in a studio at WYDE with Lee Davis on the air over a conversation that he had with Deanna Frankowski. And somehow I got sucked into the middle of that and I was accused of endorsing a candidate publicly, which violates my contract, I might add, a candidate that at that point in time I had not yet even met. And the reason that I bring that up today is that I really, I have a big problem with candidates that are absentee and from the districts that they represent. And one thing, I've not had the opportunity to interview Judge David Standridge, who's here with us this evening, but I have interviewed Scott Beeson as well as Al Mickle, and I'll ask the judge to respond to this as well, not necessarily here in the moment. But one of the things I want to know is, if you are elected to office, are you going to spend more time in your district than you do in Washington, D.C., particularly if you're worried about a vote as it relates to some historic document or whatever the case may be. You're not going to have an opportunity to ask these questions of them on stage, as Zan said. We are going to kind of create an open format here for you to ask them individually. I'm well aware of the fact that sometimes people are a little bit reluctant to ask questions in a public forum that they might do in private. So that's one of the reasons that we provided this for you this evening. But I would ask you to do this, to have an open mind to all the candidates. And I know that everybody in this room probably is leaning one direction or another, but I'm going to ask you in the interest of fair play, and quite frankly, this country that we are we are all love so much as patriots, that for the next roughly hour or so that you keep an open mind to all the candidates, because that's the whole purpose of coming out this evening, is to find out what these gentlemen are all about. The order is going to be, we're going to start out with Judge Standridge. He is the uh, probate judge from Blunt County, and I believe the county commissioner as well followed by a local businessman, Mr. Al Mickle, and then State Senator Scott Beeson will bring the whole thing at the end. And oh, I'm going to keep, ask these guys to keep it around 10 minutes or so at that point in time. When the, uh, the last one comes off, when Scott comes off, Senator Beeson, then you're free to move around the building and ask any questions of them that you'd like. And I would strongly suggest that you engage all three of them. With that said, Judge Standridge, would you please come on up? This is Judge David Standridge from Blunt County. We'll try to hold it if we can. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, first of all, I would say that I am David Standridge. I'm the probate judge and county commission chairman in Blount County. In Blount County, it's a little bit different than it is a lot of the other counties around uh, this district. Is I wear both of those hats. Uh, I am the county commission chairman and the probate judge, which I found out very quick that that's two full-time jobs uh, that I have to do. But, um, you know, it's working pretty well for us, even though it, it is a, you know, a lot of hours and a lot of work uh, that we have to do. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, though, before I do that, I want to say I appreciate what you do. I appreciate what this organization does as far as trying to be active and, and getting the word out and letting people know what the issues are. Uh, I really appreciate what you do. Uh, since I've been following and seeing uh, what you're about and what you do, I appreciate that. I would like to introduce my wife that's here with me, uh, Diana. She's right here on the, on the front row. And, uh, this lady over here is my aunt, uh, Judy. And uh, Dan and I have been married 30 years. Uh, we have three children uh, that are grown. Um, my oldest daughter, she's, uh, she's a stay-at-home mom. She's got her degree in education. She's an elementary teacher, but she's a stay-at-home mom with three children of her own. And uh, my oldest son is a graduate of the Air Force Academy, the United States Air Force Academy, and he's a captain in the Air Force. He's a research engineer, and um, he's in Colorado Springs, and he can't tell me what he does because he's in a top secret type of position. He told me he could tell me in 30 years, I mean 70 years. He said he could tell me in 70 years. He said, so dad, when I'm 96, I'll let you know. <laughs> My youngest son's also here with me tonight. He's the one over here with a stethoscope. Uh, he is a... Uh, <coughs> He is a, uh, almost a veterinarian. In April, he'll graduate. And, and, uh, and uh, he was thrilled because um, he didn't know where he would end up, but he's going to buy a practice, a long-term practice, uh, in Cleveland, which is in Blount County, in this district. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're very happy that he's going to come back to this district and uh, practice. And of course, we're thrilled about that. Uh, but a little bit about my background. Uh, my background, really, as far as my career, is in uh, law enforcement. I came up through the ranks in law enforcement. I started out at Montgomery Police Department. Uh, then 
I moved to Mon Montevallo Police Department, and I finally got a job back home in Blount County. Uh, they were hiring, and I put in for it and got the job, and I stayed there uh, most of my career, and I did just about every job uh, there in the Sheriff's Department. Uh, I was a patrol officer, uh, did all the things you have to do with that. Uh, I was over the, uh, the jail. I was a certified jail manager and was over the jail. I was actually the first certified jail manager in the state of Alabama. And some people think that could come in handy in Washington. <laughs> you know, when you read the news and stuff, it might be a good thing. Um, I got an opportunity to go to the National FBI Academy, and I'm a graduate of the National FBI Academy. I was a chief investigator there, and then I moved into an administrative role and really did our budgets and grants and those type of things with the Sheriff's Department. During that time, I ran for the local school board uh, in Blount County, the Blount County Board of Education, the county wide vote. Won that, served on the uh, Blount County Board of Education, and then I ran for probate judge of uh, Blount County and um, defeated an incumbent in the, in the primary and was elected uh, to probate judge where I presently serve and as county commission chair. Well, I said all that to say that, you know, there's things about trying to manage and run government right. The reason that I'm running is because I think we've got some problems in Washington. Mm -hmm. And we've got some things that we need to work on and, and do right. Well, let me tell you what we've tried to do in Blunt County, just to give you a little snippet. We live within our means. During my administration, as, as the uh, chairman of the county commission, and all counties work about the same. I go to meetings with counties from all over the state. Some are a little larger than others. Uh, ours, our county is the third largest in this district of the six counties. We're number three on the largest. And let me tell you a little contrast. Y'all know what's happened in some of the other counties uh, here in this district. Well, in Blunt County, this last year in my administration, we paid off our entire long-term debt. We are debt-free in Blunt County. We, uh, we have a couple of little short-term things that are like equipment or something. We have the resources to pay those off, but those are... When we have a department head that incurs a little debt for equipment or something, we make them pay that back under their budget. So we have a couple of little short-term things that are that we have to pay off. But we have no long-term debt, no warrants, no no bonds, nothing. We we pay as we go. Now, if something you know, if we needed something, if we had a big project, we needed to borrow the money. As long as it made sense, and as long as it was you know going to be something that was a you know long life, then that might make sense. But it doesn't make sense to put on debt that our children and grandchildren are going to incur uh, when uh, we don't even know what we borrowed for. And that's what's going on in a lot of our different governments, all the way up to our national government. And that's what I have a big problem with. I think that that's the number one problem that we have is our national debt and what it's doing. You know, as you know, I know that a lot of you follow it. Our national debt has exceeded $15 trillion and growing every day. And you know what that means? That means that by the election this November, that interest on that debt, you know what that'll be? It's $10 billion a week almost. If you think about the interest, $10 billion a week, what could we do with one week's interest in the 6th District in Alabama? Uh, what could we do with just that money? We have to make hard decisions. I'm going to tell you something. We have to make hard decisions in Blount County. We have to do some cutting. We have to make hard decisions. And it was tough, and it's still tough. I still have people that, you know, are upset about that. But we had to do it. We had to make some of those tough decisions. We're going to have to do it in our nation. We're going to have to, our, in our government, you know, in our nation, we're going to have to do the same thing. We're going to have to make some hard decisions, and we're going to have to cut to get this back on track. Now, when I was little, just so you'll know where I came from, I lived in a place that was so small that I was slept on the couch in the living room. Okay? And I watched my parents. They farmed. They had a farm. They started a business. They ran a business. They grew that. They worked hard day in and day out. 
My sister and I had to work. We had to do the same thing. They kept moving up. They kept getting a little better. Now, my parents live in one of the nicest places in Blount County and have a great farm, really nice farm. And I became the probate judge and county commission chairman of the entire county. That's the American dream, okay? That's the American dream. That's the America that I know and the America that I believe in. But what is our children and grandchildren going to inherit if we keep going in the direction that we're going? What are they going to inherit? Are they going to have that same opportunity and that same American dream? Are they going to be, or where are we? Are we going to default on our uh, bills? You know, what's going to happen with our country? That's the reason I'm running. That's the reason I'm running for office. Now, to keep from taking too much time, I want to tell you a few things that I believe as far as America goes. I believe in an America where we live within our means. I believe we can cut our debt. I believe if we get on a system of, of cutting the debt and doing that, doing it over a period of time, it's gotten so big it's going to be hard. But I believe we can do that without ever raising taxes. We can do it. I've experienced it. I've had to do that in Blount County. We can do it. Governments run the same. It doesn't matter where it is, but it runs the same. You live with what you have, okay? You live within your means. We can't spend more money than we take in, okay? Second thing is, I believe I believe in an America with a strong military. I believe we have to protect our citizens. I believe in America where we don't over-regulate people out of business, but we encourage them to go into business. I believe in an America where we use, explore, and use our own energy resources, stop depending on the Middle East, and let's get these gas prices down. Amen. I believe in an America where I believe in an America where we secure our borders and English is our official language of our government. Now, it's time that we get America back on the right track. It's time for us to take back this congressional seat. People need a voice here in the city <coughs> district. You pick the candidate of your choice. I hope you'll consider me, but you pick the candidate of your choice because we need to take this seat back. And it needs to be a voice of the people, somebody that's accessible, and somebody <coughs> that'll be here for you. <coughs> so with that, I'll just say, you understand, I think, a little bit better who I am and why I'm running. I think we've got a real opportunity right here in this primary not to just change our district right here, but to change our nation. It's up to the people. It's not up to the Wall Street bankers who fund certain campaigns. They can't vote in this election, but you can and your friends can. I ask you for your vote. I ask you for your support. I ask you for your prayer. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. I'd like to make just a real quick point based upon what he said. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke had, in a report yesterday, reported by the Associated Press as well as the Wall Street Journal, said it was very likely that we're going to see a fourth stimulus come out in the next several weeks. This is not a debt that I'm going to have to pay. It's not a debt that a lot of you are going to have to pay, but it's certainly one our children and grandchildren are going to have to pay. And, you know, the House of Representatives, by Constitution, all revenue bills have to originate out of the House of Representatives. We haven't had a budget in this country in over a thousand days, and we have a Republican-led House. If that's not an indication right there that it's time for change, I don't know what else. Our next speaker is Al Mickle. I've had the opportunity to meet Al on several occasions. He's a great guy, great patriot. And I want to welcome him up right now. Al Mickle is a local businessman. And as soon as I can find him, I will come on up, Al.
I am Al Nicola, like you said, and first of all, I'm not a politician. You're going to find out real fast I'm also not a really big public speaker. So just bear with me, if you will. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. I grew up right here in Shelby County uh, in Calera. I went to school at UAB. I'm very fortunate enough to join the Navy back in 1988, and I was able to finish my degree in the Navy, which was good because I don't have super degrees. <coughs> been fortunate enough to serve in the military. I've owned my own business. Uh, I've managed large businesses. So I know a little bit about what it means when you, you know, try to create jobs. I understand how that happens because it happens when government steps out of the way and gets out of the way and lets people do what they think is best for the economy because they do what's best for their business. When your business flourishes, say that we all have jobs in this thing. Um, one of the things that I learned about growing up here, I learned the value of hard work. I was raised by my grandparents, and uh, grandmother died a couple of years ago, but my grandfather, to this day, uh, I don't think he's really understood the word of retirement. <laughs> he, he struggles with it. He almost cut a finger off the other, you know, last year trying to lift his lawnmower up because there was something stuck in it. He's 87 years old, and he thinks he can flip a riding lawnmower over. That's what he's always done. Um, but that's the kind of work ethic that I grew up seeing. And having served in the military, I've been fortunate enough to see what real, true American heroes look like. And I was able to see the Marines that I walked through, the villages of Somalia lived, and the sands of Saudi Arabia. I got to see what true heroes are. Those men and women that I've seen, not a single one of them, just like the ones of you in here, and I want to thank you for the ones of you in here that have served, but not a single one of us signed up and raised our hand and took an oath to promote socialism. I took an oath many, many years ago to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, never thinking for one moment that our domestic enemies are more dangerous ever than our foreign enemies. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that day is here. Yeah. And we all know it. The problem is, those of us in this room know it, but there's a lot of other people out there that are asleep in the wheel. I'm sure David and Scott can both attest to this. See people who take a card and go, yeah, I'll consider you, I'll consider you. And you go, now where are you a registered voter? much less actually register. I have a form. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think most everybody in here is probably registered. Well, we're bad looking. We're trying to progress Absolutely. Thank you very much. Dead, deadline's Friday. <laughs> yes, you got until tomorrow. That's exactly right. You know, I, I've been through a lot of things. I've seen a lot of things. I think I'm uniquely qualified for this seat because I know what it means to stand strong in the face of adversity, real adversity, the people are trying to shoot at you, sort of personal. Um, you know, I, I'm a human like anybody else. We've all made mistakes. But I still believe in second chances. I still believe that America's best days are ahead of her, not behind. I still believe in that same American dream. <laughs> every one of us in this room to not sit on the sidelines. It's not okay just to vote, go home and say, well, I did my job. We've got to get our relatives involved. We've got to get our neighbors involved. Because the only way that we, the people, are going to be heard again is to get in the game. And we have to do something different at the ballot box this time. My wife over here in the corner, she and I talk about this all the time. We've got, well, between the two of us, we have six kids, hers, mine, and ours. And um, we understand that the debt that we're in right now, it's not ours, it's theirs. It's your children, it's your grandchildren. And the way it's going right now,
right now, it's not even just them. It's going to keep going generation after generation. But I still, like I said, I have great expectations that we can win this war. But we better be prepared to do something different at the ballot box this time. Or you better get ready to pick up an ammunition box right next time. Because that's where we're headed. And we've got politicians that are more than happy to keep patting their own pockets while they're serving the banks or special interest groups and do not listen to us. But people, it is time to do something different because what we've been doing, when you look at most of the counties, they're in debt. Our state is $800 million in a deficit this year. Mm -hmm. Our country is a $1.6 trillion in growing debt or deficit. What we've been doing is not working. So what I'm going to encourage each of you to do, pray about things. Not just this election, but what you can do to get other people involved in this election. Because those great expectations that I have include every one of you. You need and you deserve a representative that represents you, not special interests. That is in the district a lot more, not in D.C. all the time. The only way that you're going to make your voice heard to start is on March 13th. Because obviously the people that are in office aren't listening any other way. I want to thank each of you for letting me come up here tonight. And like Judge Sanders said, I mean, this is the American dream. I grew up in a, what I thought was a middle class home. I, I look back now and found out I was wrong. But um, <laughs> you, know, you look back and see where every one of us have come from. <laughs> and we all have a dream for our kids and for our grandkids. And I thank you for letting me come up here tonight. And I encourage you guys to get more involved and tell your friends and family because it's going to take all of us working together <coughs> to defend our freedoms. God bless you. amount of energy trying to convert liberals into conservatives. I don't fall victim to that. Let me explain what I mean real quickly. And it, it echoes what Mr. Mickle's talking about. 39 to 41 percent of Americans in this country today consider themselves conservatives. If you look at the liberal side of the fence, it's between 15 and 19 percent. If we turned out 60 percent of the conservative vote in this country, every problem that we face in this country takes care of itself. Whether or not it's abortion, whether or not it has to do with budget rights, whether or not it has to do with state rights, gun rights, or anything else. It's a matter of getting the, the, the people out that are already conservative to the polls. He makes a very good point that most of you probably are registered to vote. The reality of it is a lot of folks are not. And I've been a poll worker, a poll clerk, and I'm going to tell you something right now that I've been on the air, so I'm not embarrassed to admit it to you tonight. I am an official organizing for Obama member. I am part of the Obama campaign. Yes, I went stealth. I went undercover. And in doing so, I am privy to emails from that campaign every single day. They are weird. Judy's sitting in the audience here. We'll be reading them on the air. They're bizarre. For $3, you can get an Obama baseball cap or a koozie or a bumper sticker or a mug. But I'm telling you, these folks are organized. And they're laying out a, a degree of nonsense that the gullible the naive and the politically not astute are buying into, and if we don't turn ourselves, our families, our church members, and our communities out, there's nothing we can do about the next four years. And somebody, I'll tell you, made a very good point on my program today. You think Barack Obama is bold now? You take the specter of losing an election out of the way, and this man is a wild horse that's not going to be reined in. It's time for a change across the board in Washington. Our next speaker coming up. State Senator Scott Beeson, I've had the opportunity to meet Scott several times. He's certainly no stranger to this room, certainly no stranger to the state of Alabama. Welcome him up to the stage, Senator Scott Beeson.
everyone, it's, it's good to be here tonight. I appreciate y'all taking the, uh, the opportunity, taking part of your, your personal time to come and listen to us. I do want to say one thing right off the bat, or two things. One is, I'm not running against Congressman Spencer Backus for any personal reason. I'm running because I want to save the country. And I think it really has become that important. The second thing I want to say is, David Standards and Al Mickle are great guys. And if I was not running for Congress myself, I would be choosing between them. So, but I'm here hoping to convince you to choose me of three, but we're all trying to do that because we, we really do want to make a change. I think that's one of the interesting points that occurred when, when it came out that, what, five people were going to run against a sitting congressman? It just shows that so many people across this district and across the state want something to change. If you look back through our history, I was sitting in one of the other senators' offices a few weeks ago, and uh, actually about a year ago, and he keeps campaign literature from decades back. He's been there a while. He was actually elected before I was ever born, but that's another issue. <laughs> um, and you open that literature, it's printed black and white. It's not as shiny and slick as some of the stuff is today, but all the issues are the same. It's like we never are able to fix something. It, it almost seems like some people want to be in office and leave those problems there so that they can run to fix them again. Let me, let me give you an example. The debt ceiling. Last summer, it was the biggest issue around. Correct? Yep. Everybody said in Congress, we got to get a balanced budget amendment. That's what we're going to do. We're going to, I don't even remember the acronyms. It was stop and lock and balance cut and cap, check. Cut, cap, cut balance. cap and balance. That was the thing. So all the, we were like, yeah, they're going to cut cap and balance. How many months ago was that? Six, seven, eight months ago? Where's all the talk about the balanced budget amendment? Where, it is? Where is it? We all know we have to do it. If you talk, you go to the energy policy. Judge Standards made a great point. We need to have domestic energy production. And the, and the claim is, well, the Obama administration won't let us do it. Guess what? The Republicans were in charge of the presidency, the Senate, and the, the House. Were they not just a few years ago? Where was the domestic energy policy? That policy and that drive to have that policy put in place goes back to the shortages of the 70s. And now we're more dependent than we, than we ever were. And my point is that we can all stand on this stage and say the same thing. And I'm going, I'm going to talk about the congressman. Let's do that. If he and I were both up here, if he, was, if he was willing to come back to the 6th Congressional District and have a debate like he should have, and this is the first of two that he's turned down. And actually, let's make sure, because this will be a lot of lawyer talk. He didn't turn them down. He just refused to pretend that anybody ever called him, even though some of these folks have called him 25, 30 times, and they know the event's here. The rumor is he may be in the district because I heard there's a possible fundraiser, so let's just not, we won't go there. But anyway, you go back and you look at these things, and if he was standing on the stage, and I was standing on the stage, and I don't know what all the signs mean, so I'll, I'll try to hurry, but we would say the same thing. We would say we'd both oppose Obamacare. If you've heard his ads ad nauseum with a million dollars, you can run those till everybody's sick of them. He's been fighting Obama. We would both say that. We would both say we want domestic energy production. We would both say we want a balanced budget amendment. We're going to get the debt under control. The difference is my record in the legislature is that I do what I tell people I'll do. And some people don't like it. Editorial boards don't like it. A lot of liberals don't like it. But the intent is to do what I tell people I would do. His intent, in my opinion, is to sit in a seat in Congress and hope y'all call him congressman. That is two different things <laughs> if you want to fix the country. You know, most of you know I'm from Gardendale. I have a wife I've been married to almost 20 years. I have a 12-year-old son, an 8-year-old daughter, and a 5-year-old little boy. It's very, very important to me what kind of country they grow up in. And we're one of those first generations that most people believe their children won't have as well as good as they did. And why is that? It's not because the country's not great. All the foundational principles are there. Principles of the Constitution. Now, there's a lot of judges and people around who want to kind of twist all that around. Every time I'm in an argument in Montgomery with somebody, and they say, well, that's unconstitutional because Judge so-and-so says, I got this as a gift. I don't bring it as a stage. I carry it around when I'm down there. I said, well, show me where that is. Most of them can't find it. Little tidbit. If a judge ever said it, it's that's what they say is constitutional. It's not what's in this little book. It's if a judge sometime, now he could have been drunk. <laughs> he could have just, just 
not like somebody, but that's how they do it. And then that's how they change it. So when you hear them say on TV that the so-and-so bill is not constitutional, don't bet that they went back to the, the founding document. Just somebody said it at one time. So that's another thing that really hurts me, so I just want to point that out. But we have the ability to do great things in this country. It just takes us having a mind to do so. The reason people get in Washington and get Washington out of us, it's not because they were elected and didn't believe the right things. I think most of them did believe the right things. That's why they ran for a good purpose. What happens to them is they realize that the easiest way to be reelected is to do nothing. And when you do nothing, you don't make anybody mad. Right. Really. You don't make any waves. Now, I, I have served in the legislature for almost 14 years now. I served eight years in the House. I ran against an incumbent <coughs> Republican to get in the House because I thought I could do a better job. Actually, the mantra of that campaign was pretty good, it's not good enough. And we hear a little bit of that in this campaign. Well, they're doing pretty good. That's not good enough for my kids. It's not good enough for football coaches. It's not good enough for teachers. It's not good enough for husbands and wives. Somebody will want to say, well, my wife's pretty good. I have a really good wife. So I did that. Then I decided to run for the Senate to make a change because I thought I could do a better job than the senator. And my voting record in the Senate has been far more conservative than the guy I replaced. And I think my voting record in the U.S. Congress will be far more conservative than the guy I'm, I plan to replace in a couple of weeks. So what I'm doing is I'm asking you for your vote, and I want you to look at the things I've done. I am a pro-God, pro-gun, pro-business kind of guy. I believe in the Constitution. I believe in what our founding fathers gave us. I was the guy that sponsored the anti-Obamacare bill in the legislature when the Democrats were in charge. And we got it out of the Senate, thanks to many of you who came to some of the rallies, wrote letters, called your legislator. We, we got that out. Once the Republicans got in charge of the legislature, we were able to pass it. And you're going to vote on that in the fall, being able to personally opt out. And what's so funny about that, just a little aside, was when the press and folks were bashing me for that, they said, well, that's just a kooky idea. You can't just opt out. The state can't do all that. Well, a bunch of federal courts have now said you can, and the question goes to the Supreme Court. And that's one of those things. We know what's right and we know what's wrong. It's just whether or not we find out whether our person is willing to take those risks and, and take that stand. I've done Obamacare. Most of you know I had the anti-illegal immigration bill, which is the best bill in the country, regardless of what the Birmingham News says. <laughs> it is the best bill in the country. It has put thousands of dollars in it. It put thousands of Alabamians back to work. We far outpaced the rest of the country. We outpaced the region. And I love the argument that somebody said, well, it's not really doing anything on unemployment because of seasonal hiring and people dropping off the road. I said, you're right. They quit having Christmas in Georgia. <laughs> Think about it, really? That's what the press said, seasonal. Our seasonals are just like their seasonal. But I've done the things that I promised people I would do. One of the things we, we worked on was we stood against Jefferson County when they were trying to raise taxes. They called it home rule. Most of you may not even know. There's probably people sitting in here right now who are mad about that. Did you know in the second year of the great home rule bill, it would allow them to raise unlimited taxes of any kind they wanted, property tax, occupational tax, sales tax, service tax, all that. Now, you, you would never tell me, let that pass, would you? No. But just for some reason, they didn't find it necessary to tell the public. So it's our job as legislators to do what is right, take the arrows, and do what is good for the people long term. So I stand here today, I ask you for your vote. I do want to thank Al and David or Judge and Al, whichever, um, for what they're doing, what they're willing to do. If you don't like me, that's fine. Vote for one of these guys. But uh, I hope you'll consider me, and that's all I can ask. Thank you very much for your time. Close the official part of the program. What's going to happen now is they're going to be mingling around here. You're welcome to engage and ask as many questions as you'd like. I want to thank Senator Scott Beeson, Mr. Al Mickle, and Judge David Sanders very, very much. Give them a round of applause. Thank you.
personally, is, if you'll tune in to 101.1 The Source, begin at 6 o'clock each and every morning. My program does come on. If you don't like me, Dr. Gina in the afternoon, Steve West after that, right in the middays, Lee Davis, but you need to listen to me because I'm all their bosses. <laughs> that uh, the station proper can never do for you. We are very much a community-oriented station. We are dependent upon the callers and the listeners. I've got some here this evening. The Koloski's been big supporters of the program. Please support, even, even if it's not my program, because I'm going to tell you something, and I know this will be a fact. Spencer Backus's people, and it applies to all of them, they monitor talk radio. You don't want to write a letter, you don't want to send an email, call a talk radio. Call Matt, I don't care. Call Dale Jackson, I don't care. Call somebody and be heard, because they are paying attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. without our friends at Talk Radio. Amen. Amen. Thank you to, to all of the um, candidates. Uh, there's free tea, cookies, mingle. Thank you all very much for coming. RainyDayPatriots.org if you need any more information about our organization. RainyDayPatriots.org. Thank you. Don't forget to be out of here and 